You're listening to Heritage Radio Network. HRN is food radio supported by you. Learn more at heritageradionetwork.org. Help keep nonprofit food radio on the air and get a limited release HRN t shirt designed by artist Chema Scandal. When you become an HRN member or renew your existing membership at the $90 level, you'll receive a shirt created exclusively for members as our thank you gift. Don't wait because this limited edition t-shirt is only available until December 31st. Go to heritageradionetwork.org slash donate to support HRN at any level. There's more swag and benefits available for any tax deductible donation. You can even get your company on the HRN airwaves as a perk of our business membership program. Head to heritageradionetwork.org slash donate. Welcome, everyone, to a very special episode of Pizza Quest. This episode was recorded on location in Atlantic City during this year's Northeast Pizza and Pasta and Bakery Expo. Over the course of two days, I got the chance to interview a number of luminaries in the pizza and baking world deliver educational presentations, and talk to the judges at both the pizza and the bagel competitions. Well, let me welcome our, our listeners. I'm Peter Reinhardt, and uh, our show is called Pizza Quest, but we also, Pizza Quest is, is, is really an exploration, not only sort of my personal journey in search of the perfect pizza, but it's really a celebration of what I call artisanship in any form. Uh, pizza is just sort of the metaphor and the guiding, you know, uh, thrust of that of that search for for celebrating uh, the artisan community uh, wherever we find it. And, and so I started out in bread, and bread sort of led me in deeper into pizza, and they're all very connected. And, the, and coincidentally, the pizza world and the bread worlds have been converging over the last 10 years uh, and kind of driving each other to new, new heights. Uh, we're seeing that a lot of uh, bakeries are adding pizza, a lot of pizzerias are adding bread. You were, you were talking about making your own bread. Uh, some of the folks here are, that are in the room with us now, um, you know, are all having different um, aspects of being in the either the early stages or the middle or mature stages of operating, you know, businesses. So uh, today's presentation, um, I forget what they called it on the uh, in the in the program, but I call it bread as metaphor uh, and and bread as a symbol of the journey of transformation, and not just. This transformation of bread itself in the, I call it the journey from wheat to eat, a 12-stage sort of journey there, the, from, from how wheat becomes bread uh, through a series of transformations, but then how that sort of parallels our own human journey. So yesterday, in yesterday's presentation, we talked about bread specifically, the literal dimension of bread and things, trends that we see coming where the future is, is headed with bread. You know, after 6,000 years or more of bread making, it just never ends and it keeps getting better and better and better and more things open up. And uh, you keep wondering, is there sort of a uh, you know, a wall that you hit where you've done it all in bread, and we haven't seen what that is yet because every year there's some new things. We explored all that yesterday, but today I want to kind of like dive deeper into the implications of bread, um, and then and try to leave some time for questions from from you folks as well. Um, so I'm just going to share things that I've talked about. Uh, I did a TED Talk on this quite a while ago, and so I'm going to reiterate some of those things. And, and if you want to review some of the things that we talk about today, just go to the TED site, and you can um, just go Peter Reinhardt at TED, and you can hear the talk that I gave there uh, where, where I sort of first introduced some of these ideas that I've been thinking about. Uh, so let me start by saying I've, I have a, a flip chart here, and I've, I've made a drawing that I call the baking triangle. And, the, and we'll, we'll start by just laying out a couple fundamentals of bread, uh, of, of baking, that, that might be reference points that we'll come back to throughout the, the time. Um, so the, what I have is the baking triangle, and at the points of the triangle, I wrote three words, time, ingredients, and temperature, time, or time, temperature, and ingredients. And I wrote baking in the center, and of course, the, I, the key word of today's presentation is transformation, the whole notion of bread as a transformational food, uh, both at the literal and metaphoric level. Uh, and so in teaching my students uh, about baking, which I, I do at Johnson & Wales University, we have classes on baking bread, and sometimes we do pizza classes, but it's really all about bread. Um, 
the first thing I tell them is is that their mission as a baker, and, and they may not become bakers in their life, but while they're in my class, the, the two to three weeks that I have them in my class, you know, their mission will be to be a baker, and that mission is to evoke the full potential of flavor trapped in the grain, and the grain being flour. Um, and that's the, cha- that's the whole game right there, is, is the whoever gets the most flavor wins the, the, the baking competition out there in the real industry. And uh, while anybody can learn how to bake bread, and the, the, the artists and bakers, the ones who are kind of forging ahead and having successful businesses, do so because they've learned the craft of baking in such a way that their breads are attractive to their customers. And, and, they, and the battle that they're winning is, is the flavor battle. Well, I say that the, the most important rule in all of this is the flavor rule. And the flavor rule is flavor rules. And the customers, you know, they, you can get them hooked on the wellness factors of bread. Yesterday we talked about some of the wellness trends that are happening. You can get them, you know, on, on your shop and on the beauty, beauty of your breads. But in the end, uh, to get return customers, they have to love the flavor. And, uh, and there's lots of good breads out there right now. And competition is stiffer than ever. Both large-scale competition, small artists and local competitions. This is one of the trends. We, we didn't even get to talk about the trend of cottage baking. But um, Alan here is you know, getting, looking and exploring the, doing a, a small cottage bakery. And that's trend nationally. Small little family operations out of your garage or whatever. And, it's a, 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 and you could say it's, it's an end in itself or it could be a gateway to another trend. Just like uh, you know, Will's uh, food cart, food, food, uh, food trailer. Food trailer. Um, you know, is could also lead to a brick and mortar operation, and so these are all both um, results, but also perhaps steps towards even a larger result or the next stage, and um, and in all of these, we're dealing with competition. But with bread making, ultimately to evoke the full potential of flavor trapped in the grain to fulfill that mission, you have to understand the craft of baking itself. So we're going to talk a little bit about, you know, a very quick recap of sort of the, what I call the 12-stage journey from wheat to eat, meaning, you know, uh, how do we take a kernel of wheat growing in a field and transform it into uh, dough and then from dough into bread and and all the stages that happen in between. Uh, And it's it's um, fascinating. It's a fascinating journey, and it has many parallels, you know, to the human journey as well. And that's one. Of, all of this, by the way, grew out of me having to answer the question that I would get asked a lot in interviews when I first started writing books about bread: is what is it about bread that makes it so special? Why is it of all the foods that are out there that bread seems to have this other cachet to it and and a hold on our, you know, on our lives and and people feel connected to it in different ways. Uh, in a deeper way, let's say. And uh, even though it's not the most complex of all kind of foods and cooking, um, it's simple in, in, in many ways. And yet in its simplicity, there's a complexity that has depth. And so I started to explore that question of what is it about bread that makes it so special? And that's and trying to answer that. I've come up with my own little explanation, my theories, uh, and throw them out there. And, it, and I think they resonate with people because we do have this connection and we all want to know, you know, why we're connected to that and what it can mean for us. Um, so I'll start with another sort of fundamental little uh, reference point. Uh, there's uh, back about a thousand years ago, there uh, was a period of uh, uh, they call the scholastic was a period of what's the, what's the word of theology and philosophy called the scholastic period where philosophers were scrappling with the big questions of life. And um, one of the premises that the writer and poet Dante articulated, it wasn't his invention, but he articulated that all things could be understood on four levels. The literal level, the poetic, metaphorical level, the philosophical level, and ultimately at at its depth, what he called the mystical level. And... um, and each one of these is like, you know, more and more abstract as you go deeper into it. And so he also said, but in order to access the levels of understanding at the three deeper levels, you had to first understand the literal level. And the, the doorway, the gateway into the deeper levels was through the literal. And that resonated with me because I'm here I was making bread, but also writing about bread as, as a metaphor of life and this and that. And, it, and it's true until I... 
until I really understood how bread works and, and what makes it at the literal level so unique, everything about those deeper levels was just theoretical and even abstract, even to, to me. It's not, it's not something that I could, you know, I, I could think about, but it wasn't something that, um, that, that was really real. And I think there's a lot of people who can get very philosophical about the things in their life, and they have lots of theories and lots of ideas. But you can tell when it's when it, there's depth to that, when they're when they're connected to those ideas, versus when they're just spinning off. You know, they're just just you know playing playing with those ideas. And most of the depth comes from life, from living life, and 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 uh, making the connections and connecting to those things at deeper levels. But first. For me, since bread had opened up sort of a career path for me, uh, I wanted to understand it in its depth. And the best way for me to understand it was to go back to how we would teach bread making to my students, one of which was, you know, the first thing I would uh, explain to them was that there's these 12 stages that bread goes through on this journey from, from wheat turning into bread. And it wasn't something I invented. These were the 12 stages in the textbook. And the first stage of the, the, that journey is what they call mise en place. That's a culinary term. Um, it's a, a French culinary term that means everything in its place. So every culinary student, no matter what their specialty is going to be, they all first thing they learn is mise en place, meaning if you're going to be a cook, you need to get organized. And mise en place is really about getting organized, scaling out your ingredients, you know, getting everything you know, ready. Be ready, be organized. Um, the mise en place for bread making, you know, goes back into the fields. The mise en place starts with wheat growing in the field, putting out seeds. Wheat is the grass, puts out seeds. The, the seeds of that grass are harvested. The wheat itself is cut down and plowed under. The seeds are, are collected, and, and, um, and the, the wheat seeds themselves still have the potential for life. You know, they can be replanted and continue the cycle of growing more wheat, or they can be taken to a mill and ground down into flour, at which point the life-giving properties of the wheat is destroyed by the mill. You can't plant flour, you can plant a seed. Um, so the sort of the beginning of this journey from wheat to eat, uh, and I'll call the transformational journey of how it becomes transformed from one thing into something else, um, starts with first killing the wheat. So it goes from alive to dead. And then the baker will then take that flour and mix it with water, maybe salt and leaven in the form of yeast uh, in its various forms, and create something that's akin to clay. And the clay itself, until you inject it with the leaven, is still just dead clay. But once it's in, enlivened, and leaven means to enliven, uh, with, with this um, living organism, which is yeast, uh, and could also include bacteria, the clay comes to life. And it begins changing uh, over the time it takes to go from the dough phase to the bread phase. And so the transformational journey starts from alive to dead, then dead brought back to life by the baker. So at this point, the baker now is standing in the, uh, just to get a little metaphor, the baker is sort of standing in the role of God of his dough or her, her dough. It's, uh, it, you've created a life form, not necessarily an intelligent life form. It's not Adam and Eve, but it's, it's metaphorically like this. And you've created a living thing that we call dough. We don't call it bread yet. And dough itself is still not digestible or edible. It's, uh, it's, 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 it's in an early stage of becoming what it's going to ultimately become. And, uh, and then as the baker, we watch over this dough. We create the environment in which this dough can mature and help to fulfill the baker's mission of evoking the full flavor trapped in that flour. Because if you tasted the flour by itself, it's, it's starchy. It just doesn't have any flavor. There's no nuance of subtle flavor in flour. So how, again, the question is, how do we get this tasteless flour to become deliciously depth-filled bread? And this is all happening, you know, under our watch. We're not in there, you know, doing things throughout. We're letting now nature take its course. And so the first phase is gathering and, you know, uh, organizing. Second phase is mixing. So, so of the 12, this mixing is second, in which we have to activate the leaven. We need to develop gluten. If it's a bread that's going to be trapping gas, you need some gluten in there. Uh, and we need to 
evenly distribute the ingredients. That's the purpose or the objective of mixing is to accomplish those three things. And this, again, very literal now. So we're going to just stay very literal for as much as I can without slipping into the, the, the more fun, you know, poetic side. Um, but the, the li- so we've, we've mixed the dough uh, following the, the, uh, the rules of mixing, so to speak. You know, how, how long to mix on slow, how long to mix on a higher speed, uh, how long the, can the flour tolerate being mixed in, and uh, moved around to develop the maximum strength of that dough without overmixing, et cetera, et cetera. Then it goes into a third stage that we call fermentation. And here's the place where this, this transformation of alive to dead takes place, um, where um, uh, this, this lifeless lump of clay um, becomes alive and starts to develop character and personality because now the, the dough itself has, has been infused with a life form and it's beginning to e- feed on the natural sugars that are in the dough. And even if you don't add sugar, there's plenty of sugar in, in wheat and there's glucose and there's maltose and dextrose and all these different aspects of sugar, most of which are tied up in chains uh, of long, complex chains that turn into starch. So starch is basically just sugar that's more complex. So it's so complexly woven that we can't taste the sweetness. So if you taste a piece of dough at the beginning, it's not that sweet. If you haven't added any sugar to it, it's not that sweet. But as the dough matures, some of the sugar that's in this, those starch molecules breaks free through enzyme activity, enzymes that also exist within the, the wheat itself uh, or can be added by, you know, by adding, injecting the dough with malted barley flours and things like that that are full of enzymes. But those enzymes start to break the starch apart and release sugars. And as the sugars get released, the especially glucose, which is the primary food for yeast, um, the yeast feeds on it, uh, eats the sugars, digests it, and basically burps and sweats. And the burps are carbon dioxide. The sweat is alcohol. It's a grain alcohol because it's coming from grain. If it was if it was grapes, it would be it would be you know fruit alcohol, grape alcohol. If it was corn, it would be corn alcohol. But all these are just variations of fermentation. So we call this fermentation, and the byproduct of fermentation is carbon dioxide and and alcohol. And then we go into stage four, so the dough is rising for the, whatever the proper amount of time. Typically, it can be a, a couple of hours. It can be an overnight. It can be also, and all of these things are controlled by t- the time of it is determined by the temperature. The cooler the temperature, the slower the process. And the time that's required goes back to what the ingredients are. What's the ideal time and temperature for the ingredients in question? And there's no one necessarily one answer. There could be a different time for cold fermentation versus a fast fermentation. And what are the, the, the trade-offs? If you ferment the dough quickly at, say, 90 degrees, where the yeast is act very, very active, you can get carbon dioxide and, and grow, you know, grow the dough to double its size in an hour, hour and a half. Is that equal to doing it overnight very, very slowly and getting carbon dioxide and gas and alcohol created in a slower fashion? and then baking it maybe the next day. And these are all the things that bakers have learned over, over centuries of what works and what create ideal uh, results. And the, um, the number of bakeries out there could come up with that many answers to the question. Every baker has his or her own formula, secret formula for how they want to ferment and make their breads. And they're all learning. We're always learning. We never seem to get to the bottom of learning how, all the, how this goes. But we go from the fermentation, then the next phases in all this. And, and again, the dough is now transforming, developing character, personality, flavor. It's becoming something else. And then we have to divide it into individual units. So the next phase, the, the fourth phase is dividing. Divide that dough into smaller pieces that are going to become the, you know, the final product. Uh, or Put it in a pan if it's going to be focaccia or, you know, so, again, the, the type of product determines how you divide it. And then you let it relax a little bit and then you shape it. You give it a pre, what we call pre-shape. And it just, that may not be the final shape, but it's just to form it into a dough ball or into a little torpedo. And then we let it rest. So it's, it's a very distinct stage. Some of these stages are just a matter of minutes. Some of these stages go longer, but one of those resting stages is a, is a specific stage so the dough can relax because the gluten that you've developed in the mixing is tight. And so then we take the, uh, the relaxed dough and give it a final shape. 
And that final shape could be a baguette, it could be a loaf, it could be a ciabatta, it could be whatever it is that we're making. All these different shapes, again, are the individual um, uh, loaves that will become the bread later. And, but we don't necessarily bake it right away. Most of the time we have to give, give it another fermentation cycle that we call proofing. Well, before you can put it, proof it, you, you have to pan it. You have to put it either in a pan or on top of a pan or in a, in a, in a, uh, uh, a linen cloth that we call couches, any, any place where the dough can rest. In other words, in a bed of some sort, which is what couche means. It's like a bed where the dough can do its final rise, its final fermentation. So we've kind of worked our way up very, very you know, quickly through these stages. So panning is a distinct phase. Uh, final rising or proofing the dough, which you, you know is you could also just as easily say fermentation, but but bakers like to use proofing to specifically refer to the final fermentation stage. And now we're uh, uh, in this proofing stage is we're up to stage nine, and then stage ten is where another cycle of transformation, maybe the the, the most important part of the transformational processes, is we are going to take it to the oven and bake it. And the definition of baking is, and I haven't mentioned this already, but it's in the center of our triangle, is the application of heat to a product in an enclosed environment. This is textbook now. In an enclosed environment for the purpose of driving off moisture. So that's what's happening when we take it to bake it, that the, the, the definition of baking has nothing to do with transformation or anything else. Uh, implicitly, it's, it, it's a result. Transformation is a result of baking, but baking itself is all about applying heat to drive off moisture. And the reason why we have to drive off moisture is that the transformations, the literal transformations in that dough can't happen until the dough reaches certain temperature thresholds. So, and those three t- temperature thresholds are that number one, Proteins, uh, in order to change from little coils of gluten and other proteins that, um, uh, and to, to create a matrix and a structure and a skeleton for the final bread, they have to uncurl or denature. And, and that happens at about 165 degrees. So when we take this, this loaf of bread to the oven in the baking cycle, the, the first transformation that usually occurs is, is that the proteins denature or um, or co- uh, the term we use is coagulate. The uh, surface of the bread is good. On, the one place that's going to get as hot as the oven can get. Um, so if we we know that sugars caramelize and begin to brown at about 325 degrees. So if you want to get a nice golden brown crust, you need to have an oven that can get the surface there. And that could take, you know, three quarters of the bake or, or most of the bake before you start to see caramelization take place. And the, the depth of caramelization depends on how dark you want your bread. There's other kinds of caramelization that occur that uh, are caramelizations of proteins. Where, and again, they will brown up. You, uh, uh, it's called the Mylard or Maillard re- reaction where proteins will brown also. And a good example of that would be is if you sear a piece of meat and it turns brown on the surface. That's also caramelization, but it's not sugar caramelization, it's protein caramelization. So all these things, there's all this drama now going on. The the gas that's been trapped in the dough that has ra- raised or risen the dough is now being baked off. The alcohol that was produced through fermentation is being evaporated off through the heat. The moisture that's in that dough is evaporating through heat. So a 16-ounce piece of dough may not come out of the oven until it was down to like 12 or 13 ounces because a lot of that moisture has gone away. But, and, but as the moisture is evaporating, it becomes possible for the internal part of the dough to get even hotter. And, and by getting hotter, I mean it needs to rise to a temperature somewhere between 180 and 200 degrees because the third transformation, if, if coagulation is one, caramelization is another transformation or change in the product. The third one is that the starches, of which bread is predominantly starch, um, will happen at somewhere from 180 degrees on, and we call that gelatinization. Starch is gel. And what gelatinization means, and again, we're staying very literal in all this, is that uh, the gelling is, is that starches will, as they heat up, will absorb moisture around them and swell until they can't hold anymore, and then they burst. And they kind of explode and they spill their guts out in the surrounding area and suck up even more moisture. And the result that we see, the visible result, is that the product thickens. 
if you make gravy with you know flour or cornstarch or any kind of starch and you heat it up as it gets closer to the boiling point, what happens to that gravy? It goes from kind of like a broth and, and soupy quality to a thick gravy-like quality. That's gelatinization. So all these three things are happening. Um, uh, coagulation, caramelization, gelatinization, as the application of heat in the oven changes this dough into something else. It went into the oven as a piece of bread dough, but it comes out of the oven as actual bread. So what goes in is different than what comes out. And the best analogy I can give is it's like a caterpillar goes into the oven, is transformed and comes out of the oven as bread. But in order for it to become bread, once that dough gets hotter than 138 degrees Fahrenheit, the leaven, which is what enabled the dough to grow, to rise, and create carbon dioxide and alcohol, all those things, the leaven can't survive. That, that dies off even earlier than all these other transformations. So the, the dough actually dies. The leavening factor, the living part of the dough, actually dies before all these changes take place. So in order for the dough to become bread, it has to die, the leaven itself, has, who, which has now completed its own mission. The mission of the leaven is to raise the dough so that it can become bread. But in order for that mission to be completed, it has to give up its own life. And again, you, that's where, as, you, as you, you describe it this way, you start to see all these great parallels, you know, to, to philosophy and religion and, you know, and culture. All these, these things uh, start to make sense metaphorically. So caterpillar goes in. A butterfly comes out, it goes in alive, comes out dead, it goes in as dough, comes out as bread. And that's the, the transformations that we're talking about. It changes from one thing into something else. That's what a transformation is, a radical change from one thing to something else. Now, we're only at stage 10, and I said 12. So stage 11 in the process is when the dough comes out or when the bread comes out of the oven, it's very hot still. So that whatever the, you, the internal temperature is somewhere between 180 and 200, maybe even as high as 205 degrees, depending on the kind of bread you're making. You've driven off a lot of moisture. You've got beautiful golden caramelization. Uh, the, the proteins have coagulated and formed a, a matrix of uh, like a skeleton structure that we call the crumb of the bread. Uh, the carbon dioxide has been cooked out. The alcohol has been cooked out. Uh, there's little whole pockets that are left. But the dough is still very fragile because, first of all, it's still hot. So it's still evaporating off moisture. So even when you pull it out of the oven, it's still technically baking. There's an afterbake sort of. And, and more moisture is being driven off. And as the dough, uh, I'm sorry, as the bread cools down, the skeleton structure, the proteins begin to firm up and become like the bones of the bread. And at that point, and it's usually, you know, the, while the, when the dough gets to maybe be warm in the center instead of hot and the evaporation is slowed down, then you could probably cut it. If you try to cut the bread or eat the bread right out of the oven, it's still baking. It still uh, feels underbaked. It feel, may feel doughy. Um, it's, uh, it's too warm to really taste the subtle flavors that have emerged. But once the bread gets down to potty temperature, uh, we, can, we can taste it. And there are flavors there that weren't, weren't there before. Where did these flavors come from? They came from the fermentation of those grains. And the fermentation could be both from the yeast, but also there's bacteria. And bacteria has its own fermentation. And the byproduct of bacterial fermentation is acid, lactic or acetic acids um, that also have flavor. And we tend to like a certain amount of acidity you know, in our, in our products. That's why you, if you squeeze lemon or put vinegar on something, it makes it taste better usually if you have the right amount. So we've got all these, these, these subtle things that we can't taste till the bread gets down to cool enough for us to be able to access them. But there's flavors there that were not there before. They were in potential in the grain. So the baker's mission to evoke the full potential of flavor that was trapped in the grain is being fulfilled if you're following the craft, if you're doing the craft the way it was, you know, the way it's emerged and, and been, um, what's the word, refined, you know, over the centuries. So the, and then, so then stage 12, remember I said it's a, from wheat to eat, stage 12 is eat. So that's the ultimate, right? That's the ultimate goal is to get it to the place where we can eat it. And, um, and in, in the textbook, we would say stage 12 is packaging. If you're in production baking, you got to package it to sell it so other people can eat it. So, but eat is the, is the ultimate goal. That's the destination. So, so this is the journey that we've been trying. So that's, again, the literal um, description 
of the journey. And, and there's many other ways to describe it. Other people have their own terms that they may plug into that journey. I've seen different textbooks to describe it as a 10-stage journey or, or even in the 12-stage journey, they use different words to describe different phases. But that's how I, how I break it down and to follow the, this, this process from the, the seed of wheat to the point where we are eating it as a totally different transformed product. And that's what brings us back to sort of the, the central theme of today, which is this notion of transformation. Because the more I talk about the bread making, but the more I keep thinking about how this parallels us and our human journey and helps to answer the question what it is about bread that makes it so unique and special. Why do people f- connect with bread in a way that they hardly do with any other kind of food? Some people connect with other types of uh, fermented foods, cheese, uh, beer, wine, alcohol, beverages, you know, uh, spirit beverages, we'll call them. Um, uh, Those are kind of the main fermented products. All of those, the one thing that uh, the fermented products, uh, kimchi, sauerkraut, all these are fermented products. The one thing they all have in common is that they're all biological processes that in which nature has transformed these ingredients from one thing into something else. And bread follows that template. The, the nature has transformed it through this fermentation. But the one thing that bread, I think, adds to the to the category that maybe more that takes it more beyond what the other the other products that we talked about do is it has this extra phase of going from alive to dead, brought back to life, um, and um, and and it's the brought back to life that is sort of the uh, What's the word? In the, in the second, in the baking phase, we've taken something that was alive, but then we've killed it and brought it back to life again, almost like a resurrection, you know. Well, there's already starts to explain why bread plays such a central role in religions, in cultures, you know, why, why in the Christian tradition, uh, you know, the, the, the teacher, the master says, you know, I am the bread of life. Why, why did he say bread? Why didn't he say I'm the fish of life? I'm the, you know, all these other foods play in the story, but bread was, is always central. Why is the communion that's, that's given, why do they use bread? And, and wine being another transformational food is also used in parallel ways, but bread is central to it all. Every, every festival in, in the Judeo-Christian tradition um, has a bread associated with it. In the Catholic tradition, there's a festival every day of the year. There's at least 365 and maybe more festivals around the world. And everyone, every time a community celebrates the, the saint of their, the patron saint of their village or whatever, there's always some kind of a bread associated with it. Um, uh, the uh, Eastern religions, uh, whether it's the Hindu, uh, Buddhism is not technically a religion, but they all have you know, various breads associated with them. The Islamic traditions, their breads associated with all these traditions. It's not a. I, I just have to feel it's not a coincidence that bread is the is the choice. You know, of of being the symbol uh, of all these ways, a way a way to help explain the worldview from which those religions have emerged or what those religions are helping people to, to in terms of understanding the journey of life. So there's these, this relationship. And then one of the, the key things in my own study, it was kind of one of those aha moments, was that I was reading something and, I, and, and this one phrase in the, in the thing jumped out at me and they said, the definition of religion and I, you know, and I was living in a religious community, so I was always studying theology and things like that. But I'm still trying to get my head around. It's still all very theoretical. And until I started making bread, everything was theoretical. And then all of a sudden, bread kind of became the, you know, the the door, the window through which, almost the icon through which I could experience, you know, life in a whole new, deeper way. But the the, the phrase was that the word religion comes from the Latin religio. And the word religio doesn't have doesn't include the definition of the term God or anything else. The word religio means to be connected to. That's what religio means, to be connected to. Or, or if you extend that definition, to be connected to something greater than yourself. To be connected, whether it's to, uh, I'll call it the horizontal connection to community of people, you know, communities in general, or the vertical connection of a higher power. That And so... The purpose, I would say, and this again, these are my interpretations. This is not theologically, you know, like uh, ascribed to any particular faith or religion or or book. But, but for me, the purpose of religion is to connect us to something greater than ourselves. We'll keep it that simple. 
and whether you choose it through the Judeo, Christian, Islamic, Hindu, whatever path that you follow or just put your own puzzle together yourself, all of this, the purpose of what drives us with the mission that we have, the mission, like Levin has its own mission to make the dough rise. Our mission is to be connected to something greater than ourselves. That's what gives our lives meaning, to be connected. If we're not connected to anything, our lives are aimless. So that's, that's sort of, again, the, uh, I'll call it the Reader's Digest version of, of, of years of me kind of like trying to connect the dots to, to figure out why am I here? It's, it's ultimately not, not just to answer why bread is so special, but what, what is it about life that gives it meaning to me? And so, of course, my, ultimately my real work is to try to help myself and others find meaningfulness in their life. And I find that bread is the, is, is the great vehicle through which, you know, it, you, it's like a lens that opens up into a world that, that has depth, that, it can, that has meaning at a poetic or metaphorical level, at a philosophical level, um, and then ultimately uh, at the level that we can't really talk about because it's so personal and so inner that is known as the mystical level, where we are connected. We actually are connected to the deepest reason and purpose of our existence, of our being. And it's not like eating bread opens up all those windows. You have to do the work. You have to live your life, and you have to try to connect the dots. But connecting the dots is part of the game. You know, it's, it's our 12-stage journey. And, and so that's sort of in a nutshell the, what I've come to and why I've, I, I talked about, I think this presentation today was all about, you know, bread as a, as, uh, as a, a path to uh, under, bread, uh, understanding bread as a path to um, you know understanding our own lives as transformational beings. We are, we are not we are we are essentially the, the seed that we were when we were born into this world. But we have all been changed and gone through series of transformations to become who we are today and who we will ultimately become. And ultimately, the final transformation will be you know when we ourselves you know leave these bodies and move into whatever the next phase is, which we get, you can get in big trouble trying to define that and, get, and, and, and make it literal. But we do all do live literal lives, and those lives uh, consist of ongoing series of transformations. And bread is just one way, one of many ways, to try to kind of put meaning to it. So that's, I think I better stop here because I could just keep talking about all this, but I'll just be repeating myself. But let me just throw the floor open to see if anybody has any comments, questions, thoughts. Yes, Anthony. I wanted to ask you now. And I'll repeat this for the listeners. I see there's a whole transformation until you get to 12. Now, in, uh, when you start out with the, with the flour, it's a starch, a complex carbohydrate. Then the enzyme breaks it down into a simple sugar. Then the yeast gives you carbon dioxide. It breaks some of it down. So it, yeah. Then you get the yeast with the carbon dioxide yeah. byproduct and the sugar by, I mean the uh, alcohol, alcohol. Alcohol. Yeah, okay. byproducts. Yeah. Okay. So that's where's the enzyme come from? Okay. So the question is, where do enzymes that are causing some of these uh, breakdowns of the sh of the starch and the right. sugar come? Well, actually, the wheat itself contains its own enzymes, uh, and uh, so all seeds have built into their structure. Uh, enzymes, but but not necessarily uh, a, always a lot of enzymes or enough to make it happen in a timely manner. Uh, so if you want to get like a richer, browner loaf of bread than what you're getting through just natural, you can add an, an additional sort of spike of more enzymes. And the way that millers do it, the baker, if you buy a bag of, uh, of bread flour, white flour, which is, you know, just basically the, the wheat that's been sifted of the bran and the germ, because most of the enzymes are actually more in the bran and the germ area of the, of the wheat berry. Um, but they will add malted barley flour. And malted means to be sprouted. When you malt something, you, uh, you germinate the seed. And when you germinate the seed, and, and eventually if you germinate it and keep it moist for a couple of days, it will grow a sprout. Well, as the, as the seed sprouts, it gets sweeter and sweeter because the enzymes in there have been activated. They don't get activated just when you grind the, the flour, in, grind it into flour at the beginning because they're dormant. They're not living, enzymes are not living organisms. They're kind of like a, a, a type of a protein that can activate. And the function of an enzyme is to break apart other molecules. They act like little keys that go into more complex chains of either starch or protein. There are enzymes that will attack proteins, some that will attack starches, and they break them apart for the purpose 
of uh, making them digestible into smaller units because we we don't digest starch very well, but we can digest sugars really. We can turn sugars into energy, and and if we don't, if it's not already turned into sugar before we eat it, our bodies will eventually turn it into sugar in our in our own systems because we have enzymes that we add to it. So so enzymes are a critical part of this. And it wasn't until I started thinking about enzymes that I realized it's almost like the key to understanding bread. One of the keys is to understand enzymes. Uh, back around 25, 30 years ago when I had this sort of aha moment with the enzyme, I tell people that this is the key. This is my breakthrough. I, mean, I think the future of bread is all about enzymes. But it's not only all about enzymes, but it's one of those things that we never think about. We always think of yeast and fermentation and gas and carbon dioxide. But enzymes are critical to that because they facilitate the process. But if you break down a starch molecule too much, and let's say there's so much enzyme activity that the, that the starch com Did I lose this? It completely breaks down um, uh, and, and it becomes all sugar or so much sugar that it can no longer gelatinize and hold the structure together when you bake the loaf. Then you get the result is something that's very gummy. Uh, and um, it's a common problem in certain kinds of breads, rye bread for instance, which is very uh, low in gluten compared to wheat, but it's, it has a type of, um, a type of starch uh, uh, that is an actual gum called pentasan. It's a sugar. It's a sugar product that's called pentasan that, well, pentasan can take over a rye bread if, if, uh, if the enzymes that are in the rye flour break it down too much because there's, there's lots of enzymes, but, you know, the, it's a different structure than wheat. So what they found is bakers have, whether they discovered it accidentally because there was no science back then to explain it, but now science can explain it, that what, uh, one thing that can control enzyme activity and slow it down is acid. And that's why rye breads are very often, most often made with some kind of sourdough starter. Even if it's not exclusive, when you buy a regular normal, you know, deli rye at the soft deli rye, you know, it's probably got sourdough starter in it or some acid, you know, depending on how the bakery has made the bread. But it also may have regular commercial yeast, which is faster. But but traditional rye breads were almost made exclusively with sourdough starter because sourdough has more bacterial activity than regular bread does, and um, that. As, uh, acidic activity, the byproduct of the bacterial fermentation is acid, whether it's lactic acid or acetic acid. They both have different flavor profiles. And uh, that acid controls the uh, enzyme activity. So, the, so it, when you're learning fundamental baking, they say use a sourdough starter in your rye bread because it will prevent it be from becoming gummy. It will it, um, uh, inhibit the penicillin gums from taking over and making your, your rye bread taste gummy. So that's like one of the first tricks that bakers learn is that use acid type ingredients like starters when making rye bread. Um, and, and that's the reason. There's always a reason behind these things. There's a function, a functionality of ingredients that in culinary schools we have to teach our students first and foremost how to use the toolkit. Uh, uh, and the, the toolkit of a chef is the ingredients that they're working with. So, but you can't, if you don't know how the tools work, if you don't know how to use a screwdriver, then it's just a it's just a piece of metal, you know, with a with a, a flat point. But if you know how to use those tools, you can have the ability to create original recipes or follow other recipes and make great tasting food. Remember, ultimately, the mission, whether you're a chef or a, a baker, is to deliver maximum flavor. That's the goal. All this other stuff that we've been talking about, how you get there. The function, the, the transformations that take place through baking or sauteing or frying, all these things that happen in cooking, those are just means to an end. The end for a chef is to deliver the best tasting food to the customer so that they'll come back and buy more of their food. You know? <laughs> Same thing with the baker. Um, and, and, so, and, and, and so when people ask me, well, what's the rule that governs, the, can I do this or that or whatever? I said, well, what's the result? Are you getting something that tastes really good? Because there's only one rule that really matters to a chef or a cook, and that is the flavor rule. Rule. And the flavor, this, I think we may be losing this. That's the law, yeah. Uh, I'm probably blocking it with this microphone. So the flavor rule is that flavor rules. I'm repeating what I said earlier for the folks who came in later. So flavor rules, that's our goal, is to deliver the best flavor. Whoever delivers the best flavor, and if they have a, if if they have a good business plan, can usually succeed and thrive and beat the competition. And bakers all have their own way that they believe that, they're, that they, it helps them achieve the best quality bread. And, and we call that way the craft of baking.
for those of you who have been down in the you know, expo, the pizza expo, and they have met Tony Gemignani, who's doing <clears throat> demonstrations on how to make all different kinds of pizzas. He's got one of the most successful pizzerias, you know, in the world. And on every box, pizza box that he has printed, there's a, a little phrase on there that says, respect the craft. And one of his contributions to the education of the next generation of pizza makers has been to help define the uh, the pathway of being a pizzaiolo as being a craft, a noble craft. That's what inspired him to become one, was the nobility of the craft of pizza making. And, and that kind of was an aha for him. It helped him connect to a bigger picture. Uh, and I love the fact that he prints it on there. I, I've interviewed him on Pizza Quest, and we have videos of him, and we see that, that sign that says, respect the craft. That's become a, a mantra for him. And again, another way to, to um, help people understand and get frame for us how to find meaning in life. So if we think of bread making and, and baking and cooking and all these as crafts, um, that's what we're trying to do is become crafts people uh, producing the best quality. But why do we want to be crafts? So that we can ultimately fulfill the mission of evoking the full potential of flavor trapped in those ingredients. And for bakers, it's mainly the grain. Yes, Rich. Uh, Oh, and I'll repeat this. How critically important is it to monitor uh, temperature versus pH as well as ash content versus gluten formation? Well, yeah, so, you're, so he's asking how important it is to monitor the various things like gluten formation, ash content in your flour, uh, and the pH of the dough. Well, these are all, uh, again, tools of the trade that you're, de that you're defining. And, and when, in terms of monitoring them, it has to do with, you know, how much we want to fine-tune our process. So the baking process, the craft of baking is a process. And uh, these are different ways and different uh, – uh, you can make a loaf of bread without understanding any of that stuff by just following the steps of, you know, of, of putting a loaf of bread together and knowing how to mix it, shape it, and bake it. But uh, when you're in the business of baking – then and you want to deliver a reliable, consistent product, then then the craftspeople that have gone before us have identified certain benchmarks for, that we look for. So why is why am I following the same what seems to be the same recipe as my competitor, but their breads taste different than my breads? Why is that? And and maybe because they're using a different flour, and that flour may have a different. Um, either uh, protein content or ash content. Ash is an important part of, um, uh, of it, it provides a certain amount of flavor as well as fiber. Uh, ash is what, if you take flour and, and burn it, uh, they weigh what the, what the ashes weigh. That determines a number that gives an, an ash content to that particular flour. And it's usually related to the fiber that's still left behind. A, a super um, double zero type flour that's been finally um, uh, sifted to remove all the bran and all the germ, and you've got this pure white endosperm-based flour, is going to have a very low ash content because hardly any of the fiber has gotten through. Uh, a flour that's whole grain, 100% whole grain, so it's got all the, all the uh, uh, bran and all of the germ still in it, that's going to have a higher ash content. And then there's all different flours in between. So is it important to monitor all of that? Only if you, you know, are, are going to then um, uh, formulate a process for your company, your product line, that's going to be consistent from time to time. And so if you change flowers uh, and you've noticed a change, a change in, in flavor or function or performance, you can somehow trace it back sometimes to these variations. And the pH is very important if you're doing uh, especially natural fermentation, like sourdough fermentation, um, which, is, which is creating acid because pH is directly related to the alkaline acid balance. And sourdough starters have a pH typically of somewhere between 3.5 and 4 on the 14-point on the scale of pH. And anything below 7 is considered on the acidic side. Anything above 7 is considered on the alkaline side. And all these things are, you know, are in, in different products uh, factored in to the delivery of flavor. And that flavor could be, uh, you may prefer to have it less acidic or maybe less sour or this or that. So you're going to want to have the final product be somewhere 
closer to the seven, but uh, and usually with bread, we're going to be like a regular bread that's not made with sourdough starter. We'll probably have a pH of around f- between 5.5 and six. Let's say so it's on the acidic side of the scale, but it's not very acidic. Whereas a sourdough bread, if you could test the pH, your target might be to have it be 3.8 if you really want like a really nice tangy sourdough bread. And all these things uh, are part of that craft that we talked about that. Um, the, the deeper you get into it, the more you want to understand all these different things that affect the outcome. So just in terms of your question, Rich, of how much do we mon- have to monitor those, the answer is, as with a lot of things, it depends. And, and it depends on what your goals are and what your outcome is. If you're a hobbyist, a craft baker that just wants to do it for fun, and you don't necessarily have to know all this, you can, you can intuit it. You can get a feeling for it without having to know all the science behind it. But, but people who are doing it for a living, they, it gives you more power if you have more knowledge you know, to be able to control. And bakers, uh, if, nothing, if we're nothing else, bakers are control freaks because you have to control your environment in order to get consistent results. And that, it comes back to our triangle. You know, we can, the way we control it is the relationship between time temperature and ingredients any change in any one of those points on the triangle affects the other points so if we if we change the temperature it affects the time that it's going to take to ferment or release those flavors etc does that does that does that address your question Uh, say a little louder because i can't hear Uh-huh. I'm curious to see what takeaways you thought would be would, would, would be the best takeaways to share from modernist pizza, modernist bread. Oh, the modernist books? The, what, yes. What would be the best takeaways to share that have been proven or dispelled those two tomes? Well, there's, there's been these, two, these uh, important books. There's been actually three modernist books, modernist cuisine, modernist bread, and modernist pizza which is the most recent edition. And these are, you know, these five volume encyclopedias of the subject. And ultimately the mission of Nathan Mirvold and his team is to bring together the science of cooking with the craft. Uh, and some of it grew out of the work of chefs like uh, um, uh, Ferran, Idrea, and other modernist type chefs who, who they sometimes will call molecular gastronomy type chefs. But it, it's ultimately, again, he'll say the same thing, that the goal is to deliver best flavor, purest flavor. The goal of that those books is to find the purest, best flavors through these various crafts of baking, you know, uh, or, or as, as it's applied to pizza, bread, or cooking in general. Uh, so the takeaway is, I think, the most important takeaway of those books and why people are buying them, even though they cost like $600 when they come out, why did they sell out? Why were they able to sell so many of them? Is because people are fascinated. We, we want to understand the why, not just the how. And because uh, cookbooks give you the how. And you can just follow the recipe. A recipe is a, is a guide, a, a template for a how to get to a finished result. Um, but... It doesn't always answer the why. Most of the more recent cookbooks of, my, of the last 10, 15 years have been much more connected to the science behind it because now we're never satisfied with only the how. And now we want to know, you know the why. And the why is actually more, a more important driving force in our lives in terms of search for meaning. Um, you know, there's some great uh, talks on the Internet, uh, like people like Simon Sinek, who talks about the, that we have to, in order to have a fulfilling life, we have to first know our why before we know our how. And I, and I agree with that, you know, and so that's why, and, and we're seeing, you know, a desire in the culinary cooking with people who've been watching a lot of cooking shows, even if they're not professionals, they're, they're, they're fascinated by the craft of, of cooking and, and gastronomy, but they want to know why, why do I make a certain choice? Uh, why do I bake it 350 and not 375? Why, what's the difference? What's the, what, what's the reason why? So I think that those books, the modernist books, uh, really address and they've tapped in to that deep desire that, that many people have. Not all people can afford a $600 book, or, or, but you can also buy other books that, that address it in similar ways for less money. But they, they address the why as much as the how. So that's my biggest takeaway of those books as far as specific things uh, as it applies to bread or pizza. Um, 
I think it just goes back to everything we've been talking about. It's just under, to empower ourselves to do a better, to deliver a better product. It's giving us a much more complex toolbox to work with. And not everybody wants to enmesh themselves in all those, you know, those aspects. But there's enough people to do to buy the books because they're selling. I mean, that book, when it came out, Nathan, I, I worked with the, them a little bit on the Modernist Bread book. I got to know mate Nathan and go out to the headquarters in, in Seattle where they do it all. And, um, and we've interviewed Nathan on, on Pizza Quest, so he's talked about this himself, um, is that um, uh, they – the folks there are really fascinated with, you know, breaking the whole process apart and being able to really uh, empower people. It's all, it comes down to empowerment of, of people to, uh, to be able to make choices that will deliver the best possible outcome. And that's really, he's a scientist. Nathan's a scientist at heart. And so uh, he, he wants people to have as much power as they can to create those, those outcomes. Um, so uh, I, they will experiment with a hundred different ways of making a baguette to find out which number one, which which ones uh, achieved the best results, and then figure out what did we do differently in these that made that result come about. So uh, it's, it's a pretty cool if you if you want to get if you're not familiar already, and most people are, but if you would like to get into it more deeply, just uh, go to the Pizza Quest archives and. Uh, or, or the Bread International Symposium of Bread archive, where I also we also had him on as a guest and interviewed him, and just look up Nathan Mirvald, uh, and and he gets to talk a little bit more about what his goals were in, in trying to deliver these products. So what I was going to say is when he first did the first modernist cuisine book, and uh, and a lot of people said, well, who's going to buy this? This is going to cost a lot of money. It's a five volume thing. The photography is unbelievable, and and uh, you're going to sell it for six hundred dollars. Who's going to buy this? And he said, I don't know if anyone's going to buy it. He said, but I had to do this. I had to make this. And if nobody buys it, I'll give them away. Well, he was wrong. They, there were a lot of people who wanted to buy it. And uh, they sold out. And now the Modernist Cuisine, the original uh, series, is now, I think, in 12 or 14 different languages. And, it, and it's being sold all over the world. And it spawned a Modernist Bread book and then a Modernist Pizza book. And they're selling People are buying them. So he's tapped into something. And I think if I were to put it in my own words, I think what he's tapped into is the desire for people to find the why that leads to the how. Yes. Um, so let me uh, just talk a little bit about salt. Okay. Question about salt. I just so, want to check our time. Yeah. I don't know. Um, so when we, you're talking about the enzymes, you're talking about processing them. Also, the kind of thing. I mean, there's a lot of like, I make sourdough almost exclusively. And so we always talk about an auto Right. Because it, it, it changes the, the process, or it's supposed to be changes the process. And I'm just wondering what your thoughts are on, on that. So, so the question has to do with, well, you know, why, where does salt fit into these various processes? Like if you make a, a dough and leave the salt out, why, do we, why would we do that? Or if you're making a pre-ferment, like a biga or a, a pouliche, these different sponges, and you don't put salt. salt. Yeah, why? So where does salt? So the, question, so the answer to that starts with what is the function of salt in the dough? And, and salt has uh, at least two functions, probably more, but the two most important functions for bread making is, number one, it adds flavor, and it helps, and it actually will help with gluten development if you have the right amount of salt, but it'll destroy gluten development if you have too much salt. So, uh, but it, if, if, if used properly, it will strengthen a dough. And, and one of the ways we can see that is, is that if you mix a dough and leave the salt out, the dough might feel a certain way and it'll feel kind of soft and slack. And if you just do no other changes but add salt to it and then mix for another minute or two so the salt gets distributed, the dough actually tightens up. And so we know that it has a, a certain function of strengthening dough. Uh, but it also, and it adds flavor. It makes flavors, you know, kind of come together. But from another functional uh, aspect of salt, it actually acts as a, well, salt has been used for centuries as a preservative because it stops fermentation it slows fermentation down so when we add salt to a dough we're actually controlling the rate of fermentation um, to some degree not enough if we again if we don't use too much the fermentation will happen but it'll happen at a slower pace than if we leave the salt out so um, 
so sometimes when one technique that's been developed is to mix the flour and the water together first, leave the yeast and the salt out, but just just let the dough develop, give it time for to hydrate, for the flour to hydrate and for the gluten to develop and everything else in a faster rate than it would if we had salt in there. Uh, and there are even breads that are like Tuscan style breads where they, they have yeast but they have no salt because they put a lot of salty things on top. Those breads ferment much faster than breads that are made without salt. So in the end, again, these are all different techniques that have developed in different cultures that sometimes become codified because people love the, the end result, so they become kind of like a law unto themselves, but you might be able to get to the same result differently. Um, what, do you need that? Does it really improve your bread by not putting the salt in at the beginning, mixing it, and then adding the salt later? Uh, it's debatable. It's debatable. But, but it's a technique. And for some bakers, they, by, by um, uh, um, mixing their dough but with, and leaving the salt out first, they can let the dough develop a little faster. It, it helps them on the time side. And then by the time they add the salt to it, they get back into the full fermentation cycles. And they, maybe they've cut half an hour or 45 minutes off the process, which might be valuable to them in terms of their production runs. Um, the flavor results, I would say... In the end, you can't argue with success. If a bread tastes great and they got there a certain way, you're not going to tell them to, to fix it because it's not broken. But could somebody else get to that same result in a different way? Usually, yes. But, uh, but still, part of the, the, the joy of the, of the people making the product is their connection to that product. Remember, you go back to that whole sense of what's our purpose, you know, and it's to be connected to something. Part of our of what gives us joy in life is to be connected in different ways. And some of those connections are emotional connections that may not be logical or rational. They, they, there's probably, you know, some basis in them, but there may not be exclusively, you know, like the one way up the mountain is this way. There could be many paths up that mountain to get there. But how we connect to it, I take, I choose this path here because the connecting points along that way make sense to me, and I connect to those points. Uh, other people may have different ways of, of connecting. I always, uh, uh, one of my mentors uh, had a phrase, he said, uh, uh, to reverence the reverences of others, but not the things they revere. Reverence the reverences of others, not the things they revere. So we all have things that we revere. But, and, I, and, 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 I, and, and my choice is to reverence those choices that you made, but not necessarily to, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not you. I want you to be free to be yourself. So we're all gonna have different ways to get to climb the mountain, that's, it's, it's true with bread making as well. There's different ways. And all these are techniques that have emerged. The pouliche technique, um, which is a sponge of equal parts water and flour with a tiny little pinch of yeast, is a way to pre-ferment some dough to add to a final dough to further it along, to quantum age the dough in a less amount of time. But there's a biga technique, which is a thicker piece of dough that's very similar in technique that can also bring about similar results. And some people feel that a bigas add a different flavor nuance than a poolish to the dough. But all these were techniques that developed in different cultures over time and then became, because good products came out of it, they became a methodology that other people have adapted and, and adopted to their own situation. But they're not exclusive. They're just more options, more empowerment for us as bakers to give us different ways to accomplish the end result, which is the full, the, the, uh, the full potential of the flavor that's trapped in those ingredients. Does that help at all in answering your question? I mean, it's, it's, it's a more around the circle answer, but okay, uh, wait, let me just see, if, uh, Rich, if somebody else has a question before I come back to you, because you've got, got a chance to do one, and, and I'll get back to you, yeah. So is there like any reference materials, like books, you know, videos, just There's some new things emerging. Uh, the question is, are there reference books that w w that connect to what the, are you talking about? Sort of the wellness aspects of bread. Oh, 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 the more of the, the this the more of this metaphorical religious yeah. aspect. That I, well, I'm not sure uh, if any. I mean, there probably are that I'm I haven't read. I, I'm the only one I know of in the bread sector. I think what differentiates my books from other bread books is is that I kind of weave a little bit of this, you know. Uh, uh, bread as metaphor themes into it um and but it's not it's not i haven't fully developed it <clears throat> but um 
um, but there probably are some. There are some new ones that have emerged. There's a one. There's two that haven't been published yet, but they're coming out in the next couple of months, sometime be, within the next six months or so. That are one is written by an Episcopal woman priest who uh, is also a bread maker. And so, again, she's writing about bread as metaphor, and she, she tells stories that connect it to the sacramental aspect of her life. And another is written by a, 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 a Protestant theologian, like a lay theologian woman, who's also a baker. And, and I know about these two books because they both asked me to, if I would write the uh, preface, you know, for their books, a little intro. And I did for both of them. And they're, they're very different ways of telling similar stories. So there's different – so we're, I think they're seeing – to me, that was a sign that there's more interest, again, in this sort of deeper level of meaning of bread. Uh, so maybe there'll be even more of those coming. Um, and and I, I can't even tell you the name. One is called uh, – uh, oh, God, I, I'm sorry. I'm, I blanked out on the names of them because I wasn't thinking I was going to be talking about them. But keep an eye out for them. Or write to me. Write to me at peter at pizzaquest.com. And I will tell you the, ti- the titles of those books uh, and to be on the lookout for them. But there's, you know, there's, but there's, there's more interest in, in, well, I think there's just more interest in everything because of the, 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 the means of communications that we have now. So any, any subject that we can think of, there's going to be communities of people building around it. Yeah. Six thousand years of bread is one, yeah, but and that that tells us almost more almost sociological and anecdotal. And I wrote a forward for the new edition of that about ten, fifteen years ago, um, and and it's a great book. It's called The Six Thousand Years of Bread by um, um, what was it, what's the author's name? Um, Jacobs, Jacobs, something Jacobs. He was a concentration camp survivor. Uh, and uh, and but a brilliant you know scholar and when he got out when he survived the war he completed this this book and he basically tra- tell, tries to tell the history of the world through through the metaphor and the and the and the literal you know image of bread itself so we'll talk about the French Revolution and different times of history in which bread played a part or paralleled what was going on in society so there is that book that's always a, that's a must have book for anybody who's interested in um, you know sort of this deeper story about bread um, I just blanked out on his last name but uh, anyway 6,000 years of bread for sure uh, okay Rich back to you Well, we talked about that in yesterday's uh, workshop, and uh, and so if anybody who's listening wants to know he's, what, what are coming trends, you know, pull that podcast up because I, uh, it'll take me too long to go through all of it. But a couple of the main takeaways we see, you know, obviously sourdough is just going to get bigger and bigger and bigger. Uh, it's not going away. The, the phrase we use is, is the future of bread lies in its past. And it was, re- and and the advent of commercial yeast, which sped, speeds up the process and makes it possible to produce more bread faster, you know, is from the standpoint of of actual quality of bread, uh, may have been a step back. Just like you know, like I don't know, there's lots of things that you know we we can do more of, but it's not necessarily better for us. But um, but you can make great bread with yeast, with commercial yeast. It's just that it's uh, the slower methods. I always feel like slower is better. In fact, my first book, the subtitle of my first book, the Brother Juniper's Bread Book, was "Slow Rise as Method and Metaphor." That's right, and that was like 25 years ago. You're writing about bread as metaphor without even being able to talk about some of the things we talked about today. Um, so, but it's always been known that the slower you can rise the bread within reason. And pizza makers have known this intuitively. That's why they always work at least, most of them work at least a day ahead and some are working three or four days ahead on their doughs, uh, is that more flavor emerges through slow, cold fermentation. And by cold, I mean we slow the fermentation down by the use of refrigeration and things like that to extend the fermentation time. Um, and, And it goes back to our triangle that time and temperature are so related to each other that you can manipulate time by manipulating temperatures. So that's one trend. And then uh, the wellness aspect. You know, there's so much interest now in wellness in general. And bread has been, a, um, you know, in, in the, the bullseye of, you know, sort of the anti-wellness. I mean, just bread is bad for you. Bread is dead. Bread is uh, – gluten is bad. Um, uh, carbs are bad. I mean, it's all different. Bread has been a target for a long time. And it keeps bouncing back. It takes these hits. Uh, and people will stop eating bread for a while. And – Bakers will panic and go, are we going to lose our, you know, customer? And then they all come back. 
Um, so, and one of the reasons is, is because we're finding out, you know, the, more about those complex health issues and wellness issues. But certainly, it's been very helpful in getting people to eat more whole grains. Uh, or, um, and we know that people who can't eat bread because of gluten issues still want to eat bread. And so gluten-free breads have come, and, and uh, breads that are using alternative grains than wheat, the bread grains that don't necessarily have gluten in them, because only wheat, rye, and barley have gluten. All the others are gluten-free. So there's a lot of, in terms of the trend, you know, that's a growing subsection uh, are the gluten-frees. That's not, that hasn't plateaued yet. Um, and, and I would say to broaden that, not just gluten-free, but uh, breads that are not that don't, for people who are not, who may not have gluten issues, but still have sensitivity to wheat. So allergen-free and things like that is big. And the, uh, the use of um, heritage grains, grains that are n not traditionally used in wheat and bread as we know it, but have a great role, you know, to play in a, in a well-balanced diet. So being able to, and w whether it's spelt and other wheat-related grains or grains that are, have, that are not related to wheat at all, um, uh, emmer, I'm, I'm sorry, not emmer, um, uh, teff, you know, from Ethiopian flour. That's, that's a totally gluten-free grain. It's not, you can't make a bread uh, that will rise and hold carbon dioxide from teff, but it has wonderful flavor, and it has su sustained an entire, you know, uh, region of the world as a, as a primary food source, um, uh, and you can make flatbreads from it. So we're seeing a lot of flatbreads as well. Anyway, these are kind of some trends in, in general that will, are continuing to grow. Um, I think in the industry itself of baking, um, education, baking education, especially um, to diversify the workforce in the bread world. Uh, and uh, I could say to kind of bring uh, a, a, a broader color palette to the bread baking community so that it's not no longer just simply dominated by, you know, uh, when we say old white men, but as but now there's more women and way more women in the in the industry now. Just as, as in pizza as well, we see a lot more women getting into it, but also people of all different colors and um, and ethnicities. These are these are uh, and this is an important trend because the the workforce is dependent on it, um, and and, uh, and it's also a way to help to um, to um, find livelihoods for people that are coming into say well you just use our culture you know a, a culture of immigrants here uh, everyone needs to work in order to stay productive so uh, there's opportunity there as well and and in order to make that potential workforce work you have to have better education methods to teach them how to do it properly but we're seeing that you know we're seeing more and more of that and openness to that so that's those are the ones that come to mind um, yes Yeah, back to enzymes. What does an enzyme do? Yeah, so its function in general is, uh, the bottom line, and what an enzyme does is uh, it, it breaks a product down into smaller units that make them more digestible and absorbable by our bodies to convert into energy. So that's what an enzyme does. Now, there's many, many types of enzymes, and enzymes... Are de they're within their own design of they have different functions. Certain enzymes are designed to uh, uh, attack proteins and break a, a complex protein down into smaller units so our body can actually process it. Um, uh, or and I'm, I'm using our body because when we're talking about eating the food, but enzymes can be used for other things as well. But uh, but most enzymes that we use in baking are more starch related enzymes that help to break a very complex molecule made of a long chain of sugars that are so, so long that we can't even taste them because there's too much complexity for our taste buds to, to get them. Amylase. Pardon me? Amylase. Amylase. Amylase is a specific type of enzyme, yeah. Um, and that's a starch-based one. Um, um, Protease is a any word that ends with ASE is an enzyme usually. So protease by its name would say, oh, that's an enzyme designed to break apart proteins. Amylase is a uh, is a is one of many kinds of starch directed uh, enzymes and it's the most common in bread that will help to break the starch down. And and and, and by breaking it down, it releases some of these branches of sugars that are part of that longer chain 
and those sugars then become accessible to our taste buds, but also they become accessible to the yeast, which is such a small microorganism that it can't digest or process a large starch chain. So it goes for the simplest sugars, glucose and fructose. Those are the things that, that uh, the yeast goes for. So basically it's breaking it down and it breaks the, the, the product down uh, for the ultimate purpose of making it usable f for our bodies. That's that's a the and I'm I'm gonna just um, we'll sort of wrap it up here because I want to leave a little bit of time. We have to be Liam and I have to head over to um, a book signing down on the main floor in a few minutes. So I want to um, and and I want to leave a little time for anybody if anyone is interested. We brought some of these books. Um, so uh, Pizza Quest, which is the new book, which features a lot of the pizza luminaries that are here at the Pizza Expos, uh, recipes that they've pizzas that they've created that I've then turned into recipes for home cooks. Uh, if you're interested, I'll stay for a couple extra minutes and sign copies of that. Uh, their their um, show price, so to speak, is $20. Um, and I'm saying that if, uh, even though li people are listening out there can't come up and get them signed, but I want you to know about this book. Um, and you're welcome to look at it even if you don't want to buy it. Uh, but then we're going to head over to the Lloyd Pan's uh, booth and I'm going to do a little book signing there. Lloyd Pans is, is one of the sponsors that we have of the podcast here at the show. Uh, and then from about 12.15 on, we're going to be at the Pizza Quest table, which is at row 1600. It's right at the end where the sign says 1600. It's right in the corner of the, sh of the floor show. Uh, and we're going to be doing interviews with some of the, the stars here at the uh, Pizza Expo and Pizza and Artisan Baking Expo um, that... Um, uh, are supposed to stop by and we're going to be interviewing them and run them as podcasts in addition to some of these presentations. So um, let me say uh, time for one final question or comment. Did you want to jump in or you want to? Technical question. Um, any studies done on the critical thresholds for uh, on oxidation? Like specifically over mixing the dough when you actually are there tech, so the question is, are there technical studies on things like overmixing and oxidizing? Yes, there are, they exist. Uh, my suggestion, and I, for, for listeners as well as the folks here, is if you are interested in, in pursuing any of this side of it, get involved with the Bread Bakers Guild of America. It's the most important uh, baking, bread baking organization you know, in our country that has made it possible for our bread to go from being pretty lousy you know, uh, for, in terms of the world's perception of American bread to becoming some of the best bread in the world because they brought the, the, the education in. And in the quarterly newsletters that they do, there's always at least one or two technical pieces. And if you become a member, which is at a very reasonable price to become a member, you don't have to be a professional to be a member, but you can have access to the full archive. So if there's a question, a particular question, I'm sure that somewhere in there, somebody wrote a, a technical piece about oxidation and about, you know, mixing thresholds and things like that. I remember some that were about mixing thresholds um, and also the American Institute of Baking has for many years um, generated technical pieces that you might be able to access by going to the American Institute of Baking AIB website but the Bread Bakers Guild is a great organization for anybody who wants to learn the why as well as the how uh, of baking and and be networked with the best artists and bakers you know in North America there's global members now as well because it's such a good organization but it's mostly folks from from North America and uh, and some some from the UK there's a new series of books out, uh, written about sourdough it's called sourdough club it's a website and a, a group sourdough sourdough school and sourdough club um, uh, Vanessa Kimball if you want to write her name down and her she's got a couple of really good books and she's been doing her mission now in life is to show the connection between uh, sourdough fermentation and wellness and and she's getting her PhD she's completing her PhD work right now on showing the relationship on how uh, uh, fermented sourdough type breads as, as well as other types of fermented foods can can uh, positively affect mental wellness as well as physical wellness and um, so keep an eye that's another one to put on your radar Vanessa Kimball sourdough she has two different websites, I think, the Sourdough Club and Sourdough School. And, her, and one of her books is called Sourdough School. Look, check that out as well if you're interested in that part of it. So with all that said, you know, uh, and I want to thank, you know, our sponsors uh, uh, for the podcast support. Again, thank you all for coming here. I'll hang around for a few minutes, if, if sign books if you want any or 
Uh, we can, you know, talk while we're packing things up to head over to the Lloyd Pan's booth for, um, you know, for a book signing. Okay. Thank you again. Thanks for coming. That's it for this episode. If you want to hear more of our coverage from the Northeast Pizza and Pasta and Baking Expo, don't forget to subscribe to the podcast. Pizza Quest is powered by Simplecast. Thanks for listening to Heritage Radio Network, food radio supported by you. Keep in touch at heritageradionetwork.org slash subscribe.